Neptune retrograde, Pisces 23, spiritist phenomena. Now, these Sabian images were channeled in the early 20s, 2925, in fact, um, by a medium called Elsie Wheeler. And, and she was a spiritist. That's what they would call them. Spiritualist is the modern word. And we're talking about the um, that period of time just after the end of the First World War. There was a lot of people who wanted to be reassured and comforted because a lot of people died, not only with the war, but with Spanish flu. Death was really in the air in the early 20s. And so certain people like Elsie Wheeler would tune in and see if they could uh, realistically offer comfort and reassurance and so on to her clients. Now, of course, charlatans were involved in that. Of course they are. They're involved in anything, whatever, that's the flavour of the moment. Um, and yet there, there were some real ones. And just because there were a load of charlatans, it, it, we mustn't take away from the fact that there is this possibility of channeling, is what we call it today. And it is not only given to the few, actually. And that's a bit controversial. When you meet somebody whose horoscope has got a very strong Neptune, they will all say that they know things that cannot be known. All of them. <laughs> There's no exceptions. They have a sensitivity to something else, a non-physical reality that they can interpret and is actually more deeply meaningful to them than form and materiality. So, this phenomenon exists, whether or not you've experienced it. But my proposal is that we all experience this without giving it the name of channeling. When you just tune into the higher self, sometimes you're in the zone and, and your output is better. It's ensouled. There's a soul quality to it. Musicians know this. Sportsmen know this. But I think we all know this, really, don't we? And and this isn't just an accident that, that happens wonderfully once in a lifetime. That's how you think the first one is. It's like, wow, you know. But you, you could then look for a second and a third, and you could actually learn how to make this a skill, a resource, a state of being that you can tune into so that you can open up to more cosmic realities, that aspect of yourself, which is not physical. We're not only physical bodies. And that part of us, which is non-physical, has different dimensions to it too. Any number of different systems exists exist to explain this. I use the Sufi cosmology of the seven planes of consciousness. And what we're doing with the spiritist or spiritualist kind of exercise is, is to, to access information and feelings that exist on the non-physical realm. It's strange to see it happening sometimes. I do remember the first experience I had of this and I was a non-believer. I was a non-believer in anything. And my closest friend of the time was a, a real spiritual guy. He prayed every night. He did spiritual seances every night. And I didn't know this. And he wouldn't tell me this because we were actually business partners. And it wouldn't be the thing for me to be in business partnership with some guy who spoke to spirits every night. But our relationship evolved, and eventually he persuaded me to come and see one of the sessions. And my, my life just turned around. It was so obvious that he was channeling. It, it could not be debated. I mean, it was absolutely convincing. And my whole world view shifted in that moment. Like, what? It, it was just so demonstrative. And... Little by little, I, I mean, at first, I, I, there was this 
awkward moment when the, the spiritual presences in the room tried to use my body to to communicate and speak with my voice and i i had not given permission for that so i i refused them and there was a bit of a struggle but i wouldn't have anybody taking me over so there is that part of it you need to be a little bit careful not to be subject to possession you don't know who's there just because they haven't got bodies it doesn't make them good guys you know the, the the disembodied realm is as filled with the paradox of life as this one and there are good guys and bad guys and confused guys and people who don't really understand what they're saying but say it anyway all of that goes on in this realm you can't escape into some purity of life just by channeling that's pink and fluffy thinking no it's real you have to guard against charlatans in that realm as well and um, and yet they they do have a lot more access to wisdom insights they see the patterns because they're they're out of time they can see the whole of the picture we only see this little bit in this moment of time and what we failingly forget you know we we, we don't remember the past and we can't really extrapolate what must be in the future very well either so we don't see the way they see so they've got this tremendous overview of what's going on and therefore if you can trust them then it's great wisdom but you don't always want to trust them there are such things as possession and i've seen it it's not that rare i mean not often i see it two or three times so let me read you from mark edmund jones now he was the guy who knew elsie wheeler really well it was because of him that she channeled this stuff he initiated this spiritist phenomena this is a symbol of the organic integrity of the world at large evident here in man's facility for actual and conscious cooperation with the potentials of an immortal reality Implicit in the symbolism is the fact that the individual will be conditioned increasingly by his caprice of his ideas and the mishaps of his experience. Unless he gives continual attention to the realms of reality he has thought to make particularly his own. He achieves as he holds a clear picture of the end results he desires. And the key word is sensitivity giving the uh, exceptional ability in shaping every immediate aspect of life to a personal convenience. Once again, Jones is focusing on the application of this wisdom. So if we can open up to spiritual presences, so what? Well, he's saying, well, then <laughs> use them, invite them, seek their guidance, seek their assistance, seek their protection to get things done, to get what you want in the world. Fair enough, isn't it? We're not just spacing out and, and, and tuning into these cosmic realities, thinking that that's the end result. That's just a tool. And as soon as we actually start to use these esoteric realities in a practical way, to make them practical and work in the physical world, as soon as we do that, but not until, then we can make them real. Reality is for a reason. Physical reality is for a reason. And it's to sort of sharpen our sense of, of who we are and what we can do. Pisces 23, Spiritist Phenomena. The price of living is dying. Our grasp on the nature of reality is a blend of the intuitive and the taught. And if we want to establish the truth of our unique take on life, then we have to substantiate that what we think or feel is true. There are many hopeful people yearning for a new way forward, believing in absurdities and trusting untested intuition to an unreasonable degree. Such blind faith has more to do with blindness than faith. There are more charlatans and fools than there are wise and honest teachers, and even the sincere leaders may be missing various pieces of the jigsaw. The real ones are typified by their willingness to serve, expending their vital energies. So in this we're focusing on two aspects of channeling. 
take the last one first, expending vital energies. It's it's not a relaxing process. Um, there's there's a need for us to be vigorous and vital. And if you try to open up to these energies when you're tired or depressed or low, it's not a good idea because actually you're vulnerable then to possession or distortion, which is a version of it. You need to be strong and it, it will make you tired. You need to rest afterwards and you need to ground yourself by taking a shower and something to eat and, and just make sure this process is done properly. But the first part of the, the warning is that a lot of people who do this or who say they do this are not emotionally clear themselves. They're not free of an agenda. And, and one of the things that they want is money. Um, it's, it's very convincing to, 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 to say to somebody, Yes, your departed beloved is, is well and happy and, and having a good time and they send a loving message to you and all that. It's, it's, it's easy to do that if somebody's then going to give you 50 euros, you know. Um, it, it, it's not that you shouldn't get money for this work. It's just that be careful because money has a corrupting force to it. So um, extension of this principle is not only to do with money, it's to do with attention. And it's not only to do with out-and-out mediumistic channeling, it's to do with being a teacher or a workshop leader. And it's really commonplace today. There's any number of people who say they're teaching. And you have to just check out that what they're teaching is good for you. And you can get a sense of a teacher or a healer or whomsoever you're, you're discussing, not so much by what they say as how they say it, and that has a lot to do with gentleness and compassion and tone of voice and so on, but I most particularly look at the group that they're attracting. That's the truth of the matter. And if you actually notice that the students of a particular teacher are your kind of people, then there's a good chance that that teaching is your kind of teaching. But if you find that those people are really not very impressive, um, they seem to be willing to believe things without any proof, then be careful. That, that, that's not really for you. I spent a lot of time learning this. It, it, it was a really major feature of my whole life, spending a lot of time with people. But in the end, I realized these aren't my people. They don't hold the same values as I do. I'm marginalized within my own social group. That can't be right. And it took me like 30 years or something to come to this understanding. And when I thought, what's the difference between what I need, what I want, and what they seem to be doing, it came down to something which is very important to me. My history as a mathematician at university, as an accountant professionally for a while, um, gave me respect for checking things out, proving the matter. That's what you do in mathematics, you prove things. And that's what you do in accountancy, you balance things to make sure it's all the case. You measure facts and it's true because you can prove it. That was my background. And I realized that in the New Age groups, that there was an absence of that. And that's important to me. I, I want the presence of that. I want things proved. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have faith. I do have faith. And I am prepared to believe in things that cannot be said to be proven. However, if somebody's simply accepting an opinion willy-nilly because they want to, that's as far away as I want to get from spiritual knowledge. I call those people pink and fluffy. That's how they like their unicorns. I like my unicorns to be powerful, highly conscious, white, pure. You know, I there's a difference there. And so... If 
there is no possibility of proof, as in the case of faith. You cannot have faith if it is proven to you, because faith is to do with your relationship with that that which is unprovable. You, you can't prove that faith is valid. It just diminishes the whole thing. So I do have faith, but what I have faith in is some system of thought that just checks out, that is mutually, internally consistent. There's nothing in my belief system that contradicts anything else. That's important to me. That's what the accountant in me wants, and the mathematician. I want that to be mutually consistent internally, which is not the case of any book I've read on spiritual thinking, ever. The Bible is filled with contradictions, as are other books of the same type. And I, I, I won't have it. It just doesn't work for me. And when you, you, you look at things like the, the Hindu cosmology and the Egyptian cosmology and so on, it's just like, it makes no sense to me. Uh, especially the Bible. I mean, I was brought up being taught that the Bible was wisdom. And I was like, it makes no sense. It's nonsense. And no, you have to have faith. You have to turn it into metaphor. It's just like, yeah, yeah, really. And you see, there's a good system of where, yes, there are some things that can only be understood by metaphor. That's not wrong. But to try and apply that principle to something which is patently nonsense and wrong, which is what people do when they're teaching Bible stuff, that's just foolishness. It's just not actually being serious about the spiritual path. So when we're acting in the sense of like spiritual uh, wisdom coming from the, the non-physical sort of aspect of self, you have to be very careful to check it out with reasonableness. Does it check out with other things that you've found to be workable? If it does, fine, embrace it, integrate it. If it doesn't, look at it. If two things which can't coexist are attempting to, then you have to resolve that paradox one way or another. You have to find an explanation for how two opposing thoughts can coexist or ditch one of them. You have to be sort of filled with common sense to be on the, the spiritual path at the highest level. It, it is not more difficult than living, but you have to apply yourself to it with the same diligence. If you go into a shop of a certain type and somebody tries to sell you, I mean, this is more true in Morocco, the, the bazaars of Morocco than the shops of England, but if you go into that buyer-seller sort of um, relationship, let the buyer beware, caveat emptor. When somebody's selling you something, they probably want more for it than is fair. And that's the same with ideas. And that's the same with channeling. Limit it and be sovereign in this. Take responsibility. Just because they have no bodies, these spirit guides, they don't have authority over you. They don't necessarily have supremacy either. They might know more than you about certain things. They will, for sure. But isn't that true of everyone? Of course it is. You don't let everyone just dominate your thinking just because they haven't got a body. No, be careful. <laughs>